if you tuned into Channel 4 the evening of February 12th, 1958, which was a likelihood since it was one of only three, I repeat, three available television channels at the time, you would have watched The Unchained Goddess, one of a series of popular Bell Science Hour films. Produced by Hollywood director Frank Capra of It's a Wonderful Life fame, and sponsored by the Bell Telephone System, the New York Times described The Unchained Goddess as a documentary on meteorology, though the film called itself public education through entertainment. Based on climatological science and under the advisement of NYU and UCLA meteorologists, today we would consider this a quasi-documentary, with actors playing scientists and animated characters helping make the informational medicine go down. The film aimed to teach young people in particular about the science of weather, and as if repeating a refrain from the 1940 film to conserve our heritage, man's impacts on the environment. Do sunspots affect weather, changing it in 23-year cycles as some scientists maintain, or in 88-year cycles, or even longer? What, what would happen if we could change the course of the Gulf Stream, or the other great ocean currents, or warm up Hudson Bay with atomic furnaces? Extremely dangerous questions, because with our present knowledge, we have no idea what would happen. Even now, man may be unwittingly changing the world's climate through the waste products of his civilization. Due to our release through factories and automobiles every year of more than six billion tons of carbon dioxide, which helps air absorb heat from the sun, our atmosphere seems to be getting warmer. This is bad. Well, it's been calculated a few degrees rise in the Earth's temperature would melt the polar ice caps. And if this happens, an inland sea would fill a good portion of the Mississippi Valley. Tourists in glass-bottomed boats would be viewing the drowned towers of Miami through 150 feet of tropical water. Now, 16 millimeter prints of this film circulated widely in American classrooms after its airing. I know this because I'm certain I saw one of those prints when I was in elementary school in the 1970s. And in this, I am not alone. Remember that New York Times piece by Nathaniel Rich that I mentioned earlier? Referring to the way Americans have ignored warnings about global warming, Rich writes, everybody knew. In 1958, on primetime television, The Bell Science Hour, one of the most popular educational film series in American history, aired The Unchained Goddess, a film about meteorological wonders, warning that man may be unwittingly changing the world's climate through the release of carbon dioxide. So feel free now to picture Cary Grant and Ingrid Bergman again, saying, That's interesting. Yes, isn't it? The elevator stops again, and it's 1972. Countdown to Collision begins with poetic scenes of nature that transition to the violence of tractors clearing land, ending with a parody of preposterously excessive food packaging waste before the deliberately menacing title of the film appears. Countdown to Collision is a multimodal documentary made in the spirit of its times. With an unmistakably 1970s soundtrack, the film is a wonderfully chaotic blend of styles. On the street interviews, an effectively sobering montage of urban blight and pollution, a brief futuristic sci-fi doomsday scenario. Unfortunately, it may be necessary to move some of you folks in first class back into the economy section. We may not have enough dinners aboard or, or enough wine. And in the end, a compelling narration by much-loved news anchor Hugh Downs. Most of the film points to how bad things are, but Downs intervenes to infuse the viewer with a sense of hope and agency in the midst of a crisis the film refuses to downplay. Now, in the spirit of the 1970s, this is a film that wants its viewer to protest, to get involved, to fight against forces, be they corporate or governmental, that turn a blind eye or refuse to take responsibility. It's hard not to be fearful when Hugh Downs rolls out statistics about population and waste growth that promise to result in a septic world we will no longer be able to comfortably inhabit. It must be realized that all of our environmental ills are byproducts. They are the results of the way we live and eat and travel, of the way we build our cities, of what we consume and how we entertain ourselves. And all of our problems aggravate and feed upon one another in ways that we don't yet understand. Many scientists now believe that we may be entering the twilight of human existence. 
Now, did I mention that this was ultimately an optimistic film? Countdown to Collision seeks to inspire its viewers to get off the couch and help solve the problems man has wrought upon the Earth. It ends attempting to undo the kind of apathy you saw in that awkward elevator scene between Cary Grant and Ingrid Bergman. These changes in attitude reflect that we, the people, have discovered that it's our air, our water, and our planet that are in jeopardy. To hold our institutions to making these difficult adjustments, we must reject the concept that the only freedom of choice we have left is in the supermarket. We must lay our hands on the levers of change and renewal in our society. The issues are complicated. Some of the choices and trade-offs, as the experts tell us, are hard to make. But if we don't participate in making these difficult decisions, they will make them for us. We can have the kind of environment we want, but the price is involvement. We can find out who is polluting our land and water and ask them why. We can be a thorn in the side of those who think our ecological concern is a passing fad. We could sometimes wish it were a passing fad because then it would go away as fads do, but it isn't. But when enough of us have begun to earnestly commit to these principles, we'll begin to face the facts. In our free and open society, the first place to look for the ecological villain is in the mirror. Now there is a cynical way to view what I've presented to you which is that people have been trying for decades to motivate and even scare us to make necessary change, and we haven't done it. So why bother to keep trying? But I'd like to think that these media artifacts may one day show us the root inspiration for the changes we finally made. Documentaries that didn't fail, but rather collectively contributed to what science, human ingenuity and determination, activism and political will eventually reckoned with and solved. In our digital world, where you can watch any of these films and many others like them, with the click of a mouse or a trackpad, these artifacts are as much a part of the landscape as our trees, waste, oceans, or governments. A part of the landscape to be understood and reckoned with if we are to make sensible decisions as we create our own artifacts for future generations.